Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Live Label Free Podcast. Today we are talking about quite a controversial topic in the autism space and that is self-diagnosis. I've been wanting to do an episode on the validity of self-diagnosis as an autistic person for quite a while now. So when my friend Maya shared a post on Instagram basically reading my mind, I immediately messaged her and asked if she wanted to be a guest on the podcast. Maya is an autistic female in recovery from anorexia and other comorbid mental health issues and aims to spread awareness about mental health through her Instagram at underscore underscore learning to live. As you'll hear at the beginning of this episode, Maya's previous Instagram handle was at Maya Loves Biscoff because Biscoff is amazing, but shortly after recording this episode, that account unfortunately got hacked and Maya had no other choice than to create a brand new account because there was no way of getting back into her old one. So if you don't yet follow Maya on her new account at underscore underscore learning to live, be sure to do that straight away. In our chat today, Maya shares her life story as an autistic individual recovering from anorexia and other comorbid disorders. She shares how she discovered she was autistic and the incredible difficulty she faced in getting an official autism diagnosis. We unpack why self-diagnosis is one of the most valid forms of diagnosing, and we also discuss how you can distinguish autistic preferences or inner desires from eating disorder beliefs. I had such a wonderful time speaking with Maya, and am so excited for you to gain so much value from this episode. So without further ado, let's get into today's chat with Maya. Welcome to Live Label Free, the podcast where we talk about all things eating disorder recovery, autism, entrepreneurship, and so much more. I'm your host, Livia Sarah, and my mission is to inspire individuals from across the globe to live a life in which they feel fulfilled and free from limiting labels. I am so excited to have you here and cannot wait to dive into the episode. Hi, Maya. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How are you doing today? Hi, thanks for having me. I'm doing quite well today. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm so glad to hear that. And I am so, so excited to be speaking with you today. Um, And we'd just love to start off by learning more about you and what brought you here today. Um, Yeah, so can you just start off by telling our audience who you are and what Maya's story is? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Maya, or Maya Maria, as is my full name. <laughs> Maya Loves Biscoff. <laughs> yes. Uh, at Instagram, I'm Maya Loves Biscoff because, you know, Biscoff spread. I don't think you have it in America, but... No, here it's called cookie butter. Yes, it's cookie butter, and it's just the most beautiful thing <laughs> ever. As you know, I'm from Holland, um, and we have speculas, which... And in Holland, it's called speculos, um which is Biscoff in the UK, so, but but it it is amazing, um, so, yes, Maya loves Biscoff, and let's go from there. (laughs) Uh, I'm 17 years old, um, I'm autistic, and recovering from anorexia nervosa, OCD, and depression, along with anxiety and selective mutism as well. I am vegan, I, that is not an eating disorder thing, which I'm happy to say, it's personal choice, and I enjoy it. I'm very glad you you did bring that up because I know that in the recovery community, veganism is a huge thing. And from my own personal experience, and this is also something I actually go into great depth in, in my upcoming book, is how veganism was just a way for me to restrict in a socially acceptable way. So yeah, with that said, I, I'd love to dive into that in a bit once we kind of go through your life sequence um because I think that being able to distinguish between like whether it's an eating disorder thing or whether it is like a truly authentic aligned choice with you I think that would be really helpful for for our listeners too who you know do have certain like dietary preferences and sensitivities as well because I know in the autistic community um I'm currently also creating a recipe book like there are so many 
sensitivities and preferences and just dietary restrictions i feel like because yeah we are so sensitive um so yeah sorry to interrupt but i just wanted to kind of put that in the list of topics like let's talk about veganism in a bit too so yes i i will let you continue talking now (laughs) but yeah that's basically who i am i'm currently still at school and my final year of secondary school which is quite surreal really but yeah that's basically me (laughs) that's basically you all right well let's kick it off with you said you are autistic and you're currently in recovery from an eating disorder and you mentioned some of your comorbidities so i think what i'd love to start off with is kind of your autism eating disorder journey because i think the majority of our listeners you know i i talk about the link between autism and eating disorders that's really the focus of live label free in the podcast so i i like to kind of start off with growing up like what you what was your childhood like when were you diagnosed with an eating disorder and then when did autism come into the picture because um i think a huge issue with the way the healthcare system is set up especially for females is that we are either misdiagnosed or we are diagnosed with eating disorders at a very young age because the eating disorder personally for for me became almost a mask for undiagnosed autism so yeah i'm i'm really curious to hear your story um just growing up and then when autism eating disorder and the other mental health issues kind of started coming into your life yeah sure i've always been a very fussy and picky eater same <laughs> yeah um for most of my life really I just thought that was a, a natural thing. Like It was just me. My mum is very fussy as well. So we just thought that it runs in the family or something. And I do still think that partly holds true. But I now know about autism and things. So in my childhood, really, I didn't know about autism and nor did my family. I remember when I did get diagnosed with autism, uh, my mum was saying, oh, that makes so much sense now. And I completely understand. Like, it was just such a relief in a way I don't know if that's like the right word but um it was just like oh that's why (laughs) no I I completely resonate with that like just everything clicks into place that's how like I would describe it yeah yeah it was definitely like that for me as well so yeah you know I was very fussy about the types of food I ate when I ate how I ate and what crockery I ate as well um (laughs) and where I ate like I had trouble trying like new cafes or new restaurants or whatever I had to be the same one each time and I would always get the same thing and my safe food has always been pasta never changed right yeah same that's so funny (laughs) because for me it was very American it was macaroni and cheese (laughs) for 10 years straight the only thing I'd eat for dinner was macaroni and cheese um and so every every time we went out to eat there was this one restaurant in in the Boston area that unfortunately had to close due to COVID, but we could only go there for dinner and I'd always get their macaroni and cheese. Um, and I would always opt for like the plainer option, like plain bread or <laughs> crackers or some fruit or whatever like that. And now that I know what I know now, I do think that was just me being my autistic self not knowing it and before we just thought that I was a bit odd and oh it's just a phase I'll grow out of it it's just a because I'm a little child and stuff like that um I got diagnosed with anorexia when I was 14 I think 14 14 or 15 but I think I'd been struggling for a few years prior to that um with anorexia and disordered thoughts and disordered behaviors and disordered uh, views on my body and my life food and stuff like that um I got diagnosed with OCD and depression at the same time as well so around 14 or 15 but I didn't I didn't get diagnosed autistic until I was 16 however I in effect self-diagnosed myself autistic when I was about 13 when you were 13 so you self-diagnosed autistic before you were diagnosed with anorexia that's interesting i'd really like to dive into um the self-diagnosis of autism um this is actually originally why i believe i had reached out to you um where you had done this amazing post on instagram about 
um, explaining your self-diagnosis story and how uh, reading the book, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, inspired you um, to dive deeper into autism. Um, and the reason that I, do, I would love to talk about this um, is because I think there is so much stigma around, I mean, there's so much stigma around autism and eating disorders in, in general. So we're not even going down that rabbit hole. But I think there's especially a lot of stigma around self-diagnosing. And I think a lot of autistic individuals who do self-diagnose, I've, I've often heard like them believe they're a fraud and they or feel ashamed to share that they are self-diagnosed because yeah there, there is a lot of I feel like shame around it like oh a professional didn't tell you well then you're not a real autistic or something and I mean I have my own very very strong personal thoughts regarding self-diagnosis which we can get into in a moment um but yeah I'd love to hear kind of could you dive a bit deeper into your self-diagnosis story and how that book curious incident of the dog in the nighttime played a part in that because um it, it's funny because you're in the uk currently correct yeah yes well a couple years ago my mom and i we went to london and we went to broadway in london and we i went to see the the play of the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime and this was before um i discovered i was autistic <laughs> and i resonated with this character i had never read the book before but i so strongly resonated with this main character um and i mean it didn't that event didn't necessarily t trigger me to look deeper into autism because I, I didn't, I just still didn't really have a clear understanding. And I was like, I didn't know why I resonated with him. I just did, if that makes sense. Especially because he was like a, a male, I think. I, I felt there was like a stigma there. Like, oh, well, he's autistic. Like, no, that can't be me. You know, it wasn't until I read the book Girls years later that I was like, holy shit, this is me my entire life. Like, I have never read a book that fast in my entire life. But yeah, long story short, I love that we have the commonality of the Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. So yeah, can you kind of share when you read that book and then how that influenced you to look deeper into autism and then how you ultimately self-diagnosed and just what your thoughts are on that, on why it's so, so, so freaking valid. Yeah. So I read the book quite quickly um, and as you say I really resonated with the main character and at first I just thought it was like coincidence really it's just one of those things but then as I like read deeper uh, read further into the book I was like wow this is quite unnervingly similar to me um, it's like I'm reading about me and it, it's just weird in a way like um a certain dislike for certain numbers um his likes for the same food all the time his love for routine how he can feel more relaxed with animals than with people how he has like special interests for him it was like math for me it's dinosaurs <laughs> and just like his his kind of um determined or obsessive whichever word you want to use it's more positive <laughs> i think determined is a better word or passionate you know i think just side side note with regards to like the the term special interests i mean i never really use that term because i'm like a special interest is really to me like a very 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 strong passion like i say i'm very passionate about researching the link between autism and eating disorders like i am so so passionate about that that i've i've dedicated my life to doing this work you know but i wouldn't call it a special interest because i feel like the term special interest has somewhat of a not negative connotation but it almost infantilizes it like we're little kids like oh that five-year-old is so specially interested in his toys like I feel like okay like if a kid is autistic I feel like you could call it that but as you grow into a adulthood I, I feel like there should be some well, there shouldn't be anything, but I feel like it would be appropriate for them, for there to be some kind of terminology change into, like, passion or something like that. Yeah, I see what you mean. It's more, it's like you're seeing them as a fellow adult in a way and not just a condes condescending to a child. Yeah, like, well, even someone who's neurotypical, like, if, like, if I have a friend who loves to garden, I wouldn't say their special interest is gardening. I'd be like, they're passionate or their hobby. or They have a very, very 
uh, you know, passionately hobbyist gardeners, something like that. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, of course, I see what you mean, yeah. So yeah, um, I read that and then I brought it up to my mum, just a general conversation, really. Um, and then she had the same reaction as me. She was quite shocked, really. She was like, wow, that's amazing. Um, and then she brought it up to my sister, again, just for something to say. And then my sister said, oh, finally, you've realised I've been thinking this for some time now. My sister is about 18 years older than me. Uh, she's about 35 now. But at the time, she was about 30. She has an autistic son and potentially another autistic child as well, but not 100% sure yet. Um, well, that makes a lot of sense then that she said, like, I've been thinking this for a while because, um, yeah, this is something I, I speak about in my own book. But when I was 15, so five years before um, my own, like, au like the t autism discussion came even, like, into my my mom's life and my life and just like our inner family circle kind of um one of my mom's friends who has an autistic husband and actually she she died of cancer unfortunately a couple years ago but she um was a therapist who worked with um autistic children and when she met me for the first time when I was I think 10 or 11 years old so like right before my anorexia diagnosis she she had always already said like Livia has, I mean, I think she's autistic and, but because no one at the time besides her, like no one that my family knew otherwise, like really knew what autism was, like, it's not something you're taught in school or they don't have billboards. Like this is autism, you know, like, um, I feel like you really discover and learn about autism from people who work in the field, you, you know, or like have firsthand experience with it. So that's really really interesting um that that you share that about how someone said oh like I've been thinking that for a long time because it was it was after she passed away when I read the book Asper Girls which actually my mom only had that book because this woman Pia had recommended it to her so my mom bought it and just like yeah years later I'm like wow I I owe it to her you know because otherwise my mom may have never had that book and I just think reflecting on your childhood which comes with writing a memoir can just be so powerful because you really, all the pieces start to make sense. Yeah, I know. Um, totally. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting as well that my sister hadn't mentioned it to me or my mom um, for such a long time because she was afraid that she may offend or something. And that just goes back to the stigma surrounding it. And we immediately said, no, 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 it's not an offense. <laughs> Please don't think that. But yeah, as well as reading Curious Incident of a Dog in the Nighttime. I also knew about uh, the Swedish climate activist, Greta Thunberg. Um, she's autistic and had an eating disorder, yes. I related so much to what she said. And, and she, um, her mum had written a memoir of like how Greta discovered the climate, climate change and then how she fell ill and how she got, how she recovered and how she was diagnosed and all of this stuff. And it's really interesting. And... Oh, I didn't know that. I'll definitely have to add that to my my audible uh, reading list. <laughs> I always tell everyone, like, they're like, how do you do the podcast and the YouTube and write your book all while, like, reading all these books? Because I'm like, I'm like, every new week, I like, tell my mom, like, I read this book, I read this book, my mom's like, how do you have time to read? And I'm like, I don't like, that's why I listen to audiobooks. Because like, while I'm doing the other stuff like making recipes for my ebook i'm listening to a book <laughs> if you love listening to podcasts as much as i do you will without a doubt love listening to audiobooks just as much and that is why i am so excited to tell you about audible audible is an audiobook service offering the world's greatest selection of titles ranging from much loved classics to new releases and original podcasts. Ever since I was young, I have always loved learning, and I believe one of the best ways to learn is through 
reading. I think we all know there are so many incredible books out there in the world, from captivating fiction novels to the well-known self-help books aimed to improve your life and sense of overall health and happiness. But how the heck do you find the time to read in the hustle and bustle of our insanely busy lives nowadays? Thanks to Audible, I can now plow through several books every week without having to sacrifice any other activities on my calendar. Whether I'm cooking, going on a walk, doing groceries, or folding boring laundry, I can continue learning. Not to mention, turn any boring experience into a fun and engaging one, and listen to all of my favorite audiobooks straight through the free Audible app. One of my favorite books is Essentialism by Greg McEwen, all about how to achieve more by doing less. You can now try Audible completely free for 30 days and get a free audiobook of your choosing when you visit the link www.audibletrial.com forward slash live label free. That's www.aud i b l e t r i a l dot com forward slash live label free like the name of this podcast and get your first audiobook for free on me be sure to let me know which audiobook you end up choosing and i absolutely cannot wait for you to join me in this revolutionary reading experience now let's get back to the episode yeah i completely relate um it's well, the English translation is called Our House is on Fire. But again, that just shows why like, uh, representation is so important of autism and autistic people and autistic girls. It's so important because she was one of the main, main reasons, I guess, why I started to think of myself as being autistic. <laughs> and yeah, I, I self-diagnosed really around 13, 14 years old. Basically around the same time as I read the book. <laughs> I did a lot of research um, on autism and everything just clicked. And I thought, there is no way that this is not me. But again, like you, um, when you watched the play at London Broadway and thought, oh, it can't, I can't be autistic. I, I relate, but I just it can't be me. And I thought that as well because I'm like, oh, I, I'm, just, I'm just a schoolgirl like, living in the suburbs. I, I'm not a genius. I'm not a mathematical whiz kid. <laughs> I'm not like madly antisocial. Like I am introverted, but I'm not like so distant from people that I just stay at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that social piece is such a huge one. Um, that I mean, I continually read over and over again when reading about autism and females is like, and it was told to me as well, like by my own father who. I've basically diagnosed as autistic, like, at this point, because I'm, like, 100% certain, like, also my grandma, I'm, like, 100% certain she's autistic, too, so I'm, like, I know which side of the family I got it from, because my dad's younger brother is, is autistic, um, and, like, he does have a diagnosis, so, like, I'm, like, yeah, definitely I know which side of the family I got it from, um, but I remember, like, one of my dad's, what he would say, like, for years, before he kind of is now finally like being like embracing it and being like that's how we're similar in that way is like he'd always say like no Olivia you can't be autistic you are too social or he'd say I can't be autistic I am too social um but for me and, and this is again why my writing my memoir has been so reflective um is because like looking back as a child and just my social experiences before I got a full-blown eating disorder which again masked the autism further um was like I, I went to all the parties and I chatted with the girls and I did all the things but it I never enjoyed it it felt wrong it did not feel aligned with me and not to mention and I think this is one of the those biggest like not complaints but just like telltale signs of the masking abilities is how exhausted I felt after needing to be social or needing to engage because I would be a total fake person that I really wasn't. I would pretend to engage and talk about the topics they were talking about just so that they would keep 
talking to me, you know, because I was afraid if if I started talking about how interested I was in the biology subject we were learning about in school, they'd all think I was some huge nerd and be like, Livia, don't talk about us. Like, all we want to talk about is our dolls. And if you can't get on with that, you have to go sit in the corner <laughs> and be lonely. So, yeah, so I, I really, really resonate with that. And um, I think that just, like you said, um, I think Greta Thunberg is a huge role model and inspiration for females on the spectrum in showing that you can be so so passionate and you can change the world um and i i feel like her di- like now i'm just very curious to read that memoir but i feel like she totally embraces who she is and what she's passionate about and i feel like when you can totally embrace who you are without shame and um, without giving into those stigmas i feel like that's when you you unlock your full potential Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still, like, in the process of doing that. And to be honest, I think it will take, it sounds really cringy, but it's like, um, it would take a lifetime. And it's like a journey, really, to do that. Because it's such hard work. <laughs> Not cringy at all, because actually the quote I was about to just um, mention when you said, it's a journey. And, like, I actually read a, a memoir a couple of years ago, Untamed, um, by Glennon Doyle. Um, and one of the quotes that just resonates with me to this day is discovering your purpose may take a lifetime. Luckily, a lifetime is exactly how long you have. And I think that's just so powerful because we often want to know all the answers right now. You know, we we don't, you know, take leaps into what we really want to do. We don't chase those dreams because we don't have certainty or guarantee of any outcome. We have zero proof that whatever we want to do, that it that it will work. Um, but this is, a, again, a huge recurring theme in what I talk about with clients and one-on-one coaching is like this idea of like, you're never going to have a guarantee of any outcome. Like you're never going to know the answer until you start taking action steps that can even bring you closer to the possibility of that outcome. But choosing to stay stuck in an eating disorder is going to ruin any even possibility of a better life or a better outcome. So I think, you know, trust is so so difficult especially for us no divergent autistic individuals um i mean it's the reason we have so much anxiety because again the opposite of anxiety isn't calm it's trust um and just looking at the world and and look and considering us autistic people it's very logical that we don't have trust in the world and that we therefore have anxiety because i mean neurotypical people like are constantly changing things like they don't keep to their promises they change things last minute like they're so freaking unpredictable so yeah of course we have we have our routines in place and we come across as control freaks but that's just so that we can build a a sense of trust around ourselves I feel like I can't can't agree with you more couldn't have said it better um and I think that could be partly the reason why things like an eating disorder or OCD arise because you just are so desperate for control and stability and secur- security like in your life and in your world and you just you want to know everything and you want to have everything to be in black and white and you want to control everything and not have anything changed and along with the autistic mindset being you know, of generally being quite um, rigid and fixed that can make it even harder to recover from an eating disorder or whatever. Okay, so now I just want to shift gears a bit and um, talk about what kind of your story was like from this point of self-diagnosis to getting your official autism diagnosis. Well, it was a difficult and long process. We contacted my school and suggested Maya may be autistic. Um, to which I said, okay, fine, um, go to a GP. <laughs> so we went to the GP, um, the doctor, and said, maybe autistic because of this and that and X, Y, Z reasons. And then the GP said, okay, um, I don't think you are autistic. And if you do, it is a very, very mild, which I know now is just impossible you know you're autistic or you're not there's no such thing as mild it's not a linear spectrum (laughs) um but we didn't know that at the time so it's just oh yeah yeah of course of course because 
I, I just didn't think that it would be possible for me to be autistic or be anything really so so I mean that that did make me feel kind of like invalid in a way and and it already started the feeling that I needed to prove myself in a way um and the doctor said uh, we need a report from school so we can proceed with any diagnosis so we went back to school and said uh, we need a report to the doctor two years went by nothing happened by which time I was about 14 or 15 years old and it was around this time that I started becoming depressed and like more depressed than I had been and I started to like withdraw myself um I wasn't with friends as much I started to restrict more it's all like subconscious I didn't really know I was doing it I started doing like disordered things disordered behaviors and having disordered thoughts and stuff so do you feel like here is where the eating disorder also became stronger yeah yeah I thought that as well but I I wasn't conscious of it oh I mean of course, like I always say, the first step to recovery from an eating disorder is even is is being becoming aware that it's even a disorder, you know, because I think that's what keeps us stuck in in the eating disorder for so long is not even being aware that there's a problem. I mean, for me personally, um, my whole eating disorder started with me thinking I was just becoming healthier. <laughs> What's wrong with that, you know? Yeah, and I think that's why orthorexia is also so so dangerous too um in that it's kind of like my personal experience with veganism which we still have to remember to get into is that um it it being like having orthorexia and being so focused on health and nutrition and fitness to the point where it's just unhealthy because it's so obsessive um it's it's socially accepted you know like when I was praised like, wow, she eats so healthy. Like she doesn't eat cookies like her friends. Like, wow, what a disciplined little child. It's like, yeah, well, that it wasn't discipline. It was, it was something else. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, I was in that mindset as well. I thought that um, by restricting and stuff, I, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I was just growing up <laughs> and um, doing the right thing and finally getting to grips with what I need to do and, and stuff like that um but yeah uh I became more and more depressed and more anxious and more in need for control and everything just spiraled really um I cried so many times a day and I just I didn't leave the house I couldn't talk to anyone including my mum and my brother for a while I was just quiet to everyone which was just awful um and so it was at this point that my school was like, okay, it looks like something's happening here. I wonder why, I wonder what it can be and what we can do to help. So it, it took me starve, become depressed, withdraw, miss education to just finally be focused on, if that makes sense, um, which I think is obviously very wrong. And I know I'm not the only one. I know um, a lot of people have experienced what I experienced. And I just think that's so horrible. <laughs> this is, again, one of those reasons why people have such a difficult time letting go of the eating disorder, because they are afraid, like, if I am no longer identify with the very thing people see me for, and actually, like, then maybe, like, I, I'll be even more lonely, you know? People say, like, people are there for me because they want to support me when I'm having a difficult time with eating. But if I'm no longer having a difficult time with eating and everyone thinks I'm better again, well, then no one will pay any attention to me. And I think, again, like, this is how the eating disorder acts as such a mask for the autism is that um, we touched on it before, but you were totally gaslit when when you proposed, like, the autistic component to the GP, like, oh, it's a very mild form of autism, which, again, hugely problematic, because that's basically the same as saying to someone with an eating disorder, like, you only mildly eat, have an eating disorder, but it's like, no, like, you either have a problematic relationship with food or you don't, you know? Okay, that's kind of a very black and white statement, because I feel like everyone, to some extent, has has had or has somehow food issues especially with diet culture like being so yeah exa exactly like even when i hear like 
it, uh, quote unquote people, normal people who don't like really don't have a problematic relationship with food. Like I'll hear them say things like, oh yeah, I really shouldn't be eating all this sugar because it's so bad for me. And I'm like, and I just hear that. And I'm like, no, it like, no, it isn't like you're eating five cookies right now. And then tomorrow you won't eat cookies and you'll, you'll have a salad or something because your body is craving more vegetables. Like it's not so bad for you, but like, and, like, they have a perfectly fine relationship with food because, like, after they eat the five cookies, they're like, okay, like, this is kind of my max. Like, I'll not have cookies anymore. Um, So they they obviously don't have a, an eating disorder, but, like, their um impression or just, like, understanding of their behavior, they label it as bad because diet culture has taught us, like, if you eat five cookies, you are bad. <laughs> and then this ties back to, I think, again, why autistic people are so... um prone to developing eating disorders because we often take things very literally so if we're taught in school like you will get diabetes if you eat x amount of sugar like i know for me personally when we were learning about nutrition in fifth grade um so uh coincidentally the time that i started developing my eating disorder i that's when i cut out all the sweets and everything that school and nutrition class and back when we still had the food pyramid taught me was was bad and could contribute to weight gain and obesity and diabetes and all these things that we should be so afraid of even though like the I should have been more afraid of developing an eating disorder (laughs) yes definitely I think also that can also be like a barrier to getting diagnosed autistic because you develop an eating disorder to be seen to be supported you be recognized to have people actually see you and stereotypically um like autistic people don't want anything to do with other people and they just can't understand them don't want anything to do with them because of stigma people will think oh you can't be autistic then if you want people right right and then it's again that cycle of maybe i'm a fraud maybe i'm not really autistic yeah so can you kind of elaborate on what was kind of really like the tipping point, like you finally got your diagnosis, because we've kind of talked about how you went to school and then your GP and then they sent you back to school and then you got depressed and fell deeper into your eating disorder. And then you said, and so finally they're realizing like there's something deeper than this because Maya is really not doing well. What was eventually the tipping point for, here's your piece of paper, you are autistic? Well, I got sent to hospital because I, um, I was just not doing well and then I was fast tracked to therapy someone who like claimed to specialize in OCD so not even an eating disorder or neurodiversity or anything it was OCD and we mentioned it to her for quite a few years now we've been thinking that Maya's autistic it took another about eight months for um, even professionals to actually act on that and I do understand that an autism diagnosis can take a long time because it is such a complex thing and it's you know for life so I do perfectly understand that but um for it to take this long and for it to have this much effect is just wrong and and all the time I was with this supposed OCD expert I was getting worse and worse I wasn't getting better at all so I started seeing a psychiatrist I saw them about once a month because other times they were just too busy, which, okay, (laughs) fine. (laughs) And then finally, one day, it was the 16th of May, 2021, the psychiatrist said, okay, we think you're on the autistic spectrum. And that was it. (laughs) We're just like, those words from a professional was just what we've been needing. Yeah, basically, she like wrote a letter to the doctor who then wrote a letter to us saying, Maya is now officially diagnosed autistic or with ASD, whatever. Yeah, and I think this this ties back to why I personally believe self-diagnosis is so valid because clearly from your story, you had to fight for this for years to get someone, some quote-unquote professional to to say you're autistic, but it probably would have never even come to that point if you hadn't first self-diagnosed and said I am autistic I know myself and I see myself in all these traits I am this thing and I always say I personally believe that 
the best person to diagnose an autistic person is the autistic person themselves because i i mean we're kind of coming up on time here um but i think just hearing your process and like knowing the uh, the diagnostic process like it is very long and can be painful and it can be time consuming and it can be expensive um i mean there are so so many barriers to to getting a formal diagnosis and if you think about how the diagnosis goes it, it basically is you telling your life story um describing why you like who you are as a, an individual and based off of the hours that you spent explaining your story and your life story the this professional sitting across from you basically decides like okay based on all of these quote-unquote symptoms um we are now diagnosing you with autism but but then I'm like this whole time that I could have saved trying to prove to you that this is my life story like I already knew my life story I already know my life story better than anyone else and that's why I'm like I think self-diagnosis is for that reason like maybe even more valid than diagnosis from a professional also and I haven't even touched on this yet is that autistic people do not draw conclusions unless we are 100 percent certain that what we have researched and um just that what we have discovered is the truth you know we don't we don't make claims or say things if we're not like i mean from personal experience i will never share or talk about anything unless i am 100 percent certain these are the facts you know um so even for that reason i'm like an autistic person someone who's not autistic would not conclude that they are autistic you know what i'm saying like only an autistic person would conclude that they're autistic because like you bet your bottom dollar that they have read everything they can find out there to um confirm that their what was once a superstition is now just a fact <laughs> so for anyone out there listening who is self-diagnosed autistic or who wants to self-diagnose like you get to write your own damn permission slip. Like, you do not have to wait for that piece of paper from a professional. And again, I, I'm not even going to, like, go into a rabbit hole because I have so many issues with professionals from autism diagnosis to, like, being told, like, oh, you have to fix your OCD before you can treat your eating disorder. Or, oh, you have to go to that anxiety center before you can come back and then fix your depression. And then as if they're, like, all separate entities, like, no, like I am a person and I may have a certain mental state and I may have all these comorbidities, but if you're going to help me, if you're going to treat me, then treat me for who I am, which is a person, not a diagnosis. So before we wrap up, I mean, we did promise our listeners at the beginning that we were going to touch on the veganism piece. Um, So I'd love to hear, yeah, when did you become vegan and how how are you able to distinguish that decision as being an autistic choice or yeah a Maya loves Biscoff choice um and not an eating disorder um decision because I think that'll be a great um a great insightful takeaway for our audience well I do think initially like in the very beginning of my transition to veganism it was partly there was partly like a little restriction in there but I can genuinely truthfully say now that I am vegan because I want to be because I genuinely want to be um not the eating disorder not anorexia not OCD I want to be and in a way I am personally I'm not speaking for anyone here at all personally I think veganism has helped in my recovery because I know that plant-based food is better for the environment the planet and for animals and so eating plant-based food has made me feel better as a person because I know that I'm not potentially contributing to any to anything really. And I know that my food has come from no use of animals and no damage to the planet. And so that makes me feel better and it has helped me reinforce the mindset that recovery is all about, that I am not a bad person I am worth a life I I deserve to eat and I can live whilst not causing damage like I am not doing bad things I'm not just bad 100% and that's it <laughs> yeah I think just to add on to that like for anyone who is not vegan like myself like 
the fact that I do choose to eat animal products doesn't make me a bad person. Um, I just want, yeah, I just want to reiterate that for anyone li- who's listening, who's like, well, does not being vegan make me bad? Like, no. <laughs> no, this is just a personal thing. Yeah, and I think that's, again, the, the danger of, of labels. Um, Is this, like, good or bad or best way to live? Like, I think what it comes down to is everyone is so, so different. And I think when you are living in alignment with what you believe is right for you. Um, I think I think that's the best for you. Um, and just hearing you kind of explain why you're a vegan, I can totally understand and, and tell like it is aligned with who you are and it isn't coming from the eating disorder. Um, because I always say like the way that you can tell whether or not something is coming from the eating disorder or from just your authentic autistic self is um to ask yourself the question am I coming from a place of love or am I coming from a place of fear and everything you're describing saying I want like I love the planet I love the animals I love my body and I love to nourish my body and myself and it really sounds like for you it's coming from a place of compassion and love and it's not I'm afraid um, to eat animal products or I'm afraid to eat meat or I'm afraid to eat real ice cream or you know because a, a lot of the time too you hear like um, I'm afraid to eat dairy and eggs because it will mess up my digestive system but I'm like that's again a whole another thing because maybe the reason why it's messing up your digestive system is because you're so anxious while eating it that you're putting your gut into fight flight or freeze mode which by nature turns off your digestive system and makes you have digestive issues you know and if you have like restricted before then your digestive system just switches off like your immune system it just turns off to conserve energy it's time to talk about collagen baby collagen is a daily staple of mine that i add to my coffee smoothies mug cakes and more but why take the supplement in the first place what are the benefits What the heck even is collagen? Well, keep on listening, my friend. First of all, collagen is the most abundant source of protein in the body, almost like the glue that holds your entire body together. The body produces its own collagen, but this production slows as you age and is also reduced if you have a history of disordered eating or poor nutrition. This can result in joint pain, brittle hair and nails, as well as dry or wrinkly skin. Not to mention, it is very common for autistic individuals as well as those in eating disorder recovery to struggle with digestive issues. Luckily, supplementing with collagen can help alleviate all of these symptoms. Thanks to its unique amino acid profile, collagen can aid in healing the stomach lining and reducing gut issues as well as maintain the cartilage necessary for strong and healthy joints. Further food, collagen peptides powder is completely flavorless, odorless, and dissolves perfectly into both hot and cold liquids or mixtures, making it a super easy supplement to incorporate into your daily lifestyle. Better yet, Further Food also has a wide range of flavored collagen from OG flavors such as vanilla and chocolate, but they also sell hazelnut and matcha flavored collagen. The hazelnut collagen is seriously so good in coffee and the matcha collagen makes a pretty epic matcha latte. A question I often get asked when I do share about collagen on my Instagram is if there are vegan alternatives to collagen. And to that, I am so excited to share that Further Food does sell a newer product called Vegan Beauty, which is a vegan-friendly blend that boosts your body's natural collagen production. To try Further Food for yourself and get 15% off your order, simply head over to furtherfood.com and use my code LIVELABELFREE at checkout. So that's spelled F-U-R-T-H-E-R-F-O-O-D dot com and use the code LIVELABELFREE for 15% off. 
Further Food has a 100% satisfaction guarantee, so even if you don't love their products as much as I do, you'll get a full refund, no questions asked. And with that, let's get back into today's episode. Exactly. So I think I think this is a great way to wrap up this amazing and just fully so full of value episode is this idea of like remember where you're coming from and remember to have compassion and and love for yourself um because fear is false evidence appearing real i mean that's one of my favorite acronyms yeah one one quote that um there are many 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 quotes i could write a big novel of them all but um one quote that has stuck with me in like my recovery journey is that if you convince yourself repeatedly that you do not need help that's proof that you do need help and if you convince yourself that you don't deserve good things that is literal proof that you are struggling and you even deserve help it's a basic human right to yes yeah I love that so much yeah and and that again I mean, we could talk for hours, I already know, because now I want to go into the whole topic of how to tell if you are truly sick enough to recover from an eating disorder. Um, So we'll definitely have to have you back on the podcast again. But for the sake of the neurodivergent individuals listening who most likely, like myself, have a limited attention span. <laughs> um, like with my book, I have I have chosen to make my chapters very short. So the book has a lot of chapters because I personally I do not like long chapters and I, I need like quick pace, you know? Um so yeah, with all that said, I mean thank you, Maya, so much for sharing your valuable time and sharing your very vulnerable story. I think I deeply resonated with many, many of the things you said, which I have, so I have no doubt our audience will as well. Um, so thank you so much for, again, for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, of course. If listeners do want to learn more about you or get in touch, what would be the best way to do so? Um, probably via my Instagram. I'm pretty active on there. It's at Maya Loves This Golf. And Maya with spelled m-a-i-a yeah yes yes i think that's an important point because the the very american spelling of maya is m-a-y-a um but in holland actually your spelling of m-a-i-a is more common so um yes it, in my case it's german it's german yes makes total sense that we have that name in holland too because in because dutch is actually a germanic language so Again, side tangent, um, we could speak for hours. But yes, you can find Maya at Maya Loves Biscoff. That's Maya spelled M-A-I-A. I will also leave your Instagram handle and link in the show notes for anyone who's listening to this on Spotify, or Apple Podcast, or you can find it in the description if you are listening to this on YouTube. And yeah, thank you so much to everyone listening. If you have any questions for Maya, reach out. If you have any questions for me, you can always find me on Instagram at live label free, but you guys already know that. So I'm going to stop rambling now and say bye-bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Ajar, if you're hearing my voice right now, you are stuck in eating disorder recovery and desperately want to recover but don't know where to start due to feelings of fear and overwhelm. And this podcast is here to help with that. On this feed, I do my very best to share everything I've learned on my own journey to guide you through the scary process. But let's face it, it would take me years to share every piece of research I find or every recovery strategy I have here via free podcast episodes. And the thing is, you've been struggling with an eating disorder for long enough and you cannot afford to spend more time merely surviving at the mercy of its grasp on you. So if you're committed to getting your life back, or should I say, discovering the life you were meant to live, I highly recommend you book a coaching session with me 
or 12 as I currently offer a 12-week coaching program and after many, many, many requests, I also offer single sessions so you can book however many of those as you may need and together we will work on shifting your mindset. We will create a roadmap of the life in which you're living to your highest potential and we'll come up with action steps that are feasible for you and your life because nothing is worse than feeling overwhelmed. So we'll come up with the exact steps that you need to take to achieve that dream life of yours because in the end, you've only got one life. Simply come visit me over at livelabelfree.com and I'll see you on the other side, my friend.